All right, everyone, welcome. Um, it is 2 p.m. You are in the Ask Vega uh, session. And let's start out by introducing the panelists, the Vega attorneys who are going to be answering the questions today. Um, I'll go first. My name is Asia Stewart Mitchell. I am the supervisory attorney for advice and education at Vega. Um, I've been with the agency for about five years. Um, I started out as an attorney advisor, um, managing the financial disclosure program, doing trainings, advice, investigations. Um, I still do all those things. Um, the only difference now is that I'm doing more advice and education stuff, which um, I'm really enjoying. Um, I'll pass the baton off to our acting director, Director Cooks. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Ashley Cooks, the acting director of the Office of Government Ethics. Um, I've been at Vega for six years. Um, started out as an attorney advisor. I served as acting general counsel for a period of time. Also served as supervisor attorney advisor. And I have um, I was assigned this role as acting director in May. Um, so, welcome. We're happy to have you guys here and we're happy to um, answer some questions that you all have submitted. Rashi, did you want to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Rashi Raj. I'm the general counsel for the agency. I've been here about a year and a half. 99% um, of that virtual. So, um, it's been a little different. Um, what else is there? I think that's about it. <laughs> Thanks, Rashi. And Lynn, did you want to go next? Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Lynn Tran. I am the senior attorney advisor to the board. Um, I've actually been here now for two months. Um, before this, I was. Um, an assistant general counsel over at the Federal Election Commission, and also I spent several years um, as a um, attorney at the Senate Ethics Committee. So I'm back to my ethics roots, and I'm very happy about it. Um, Maurice, I think, is next on our list, right? Hello, everyone. My name is Maurice Eccles, attorney advisor at Vega. Been with Vega for about four months or so now, and I've been enjoying it. And good to see you all today. Thanks, Maurice. All right, so that comprises your panel of bigger attorneys. We're going to be answering some of the questions that were pre-submitted through the survey monkey that we sent out um, along with our um, our course schedule and uh, invitation to come to Ethics Week. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, Asia, before we get started, there are two gray boxes. You may have something open on your screen. Two gray box boxes that are on the um, the title page. So you may want to just move them over. Are they still there? Um, yeah, now they're, they're, they've taken different shapes and they're a little bit smaller, but it's, you can still see it, but I guess it, it shouldn't be a problem as long as you can see the questions. I think you'll be able to see them. I think it's my my thumbnails where I can see myself and the participants. Oh. I try to minimize both of them, but okay. No, I think it's I fine. Think okay. All right, let's begin. Uh, we've already introduced ourselves. So here's the panel of attorneys that will be answering the questions. All right, we have our first question. Can I fundraise for a friend's campaign? Um, I'll answer this one. Um, looks like this is a Hatch Act question. Um, the answer to this question is maybe. Um, this is a very broad question and I actually like that. Um, so maybe, it depends. So um, it depends on if the campaign is taking place in the district, um, if this is gonna be a campaign that's regulated by the DC Board of Elections. Um, it would also depend on what we mean by um, uh, fundraise. Um, if, if it's in its truest form, fundraising um, for a campaign that is going to be regulated by the DC uh, Board of Elections, 
um, that would be prohibited, unfortunately. A district government employee should not engage in fundraising for a campaign that's regulated by the DC Board of Elections. However, um, if the uh, campaign for election is not within the district's jurisdiction, um, the employee would be able to participate in the campaign. Um, and so for you know, fundraising questions, definitely reach out to us for specific advice. Um, we know that campaign time is around the corner. So I'd imagine we'll probably have more hatch act questions. Um, and so fundraising is gonna be generally prohibited. Um, it, there are exceptions maybe outside of our jurisdiction. Um, so make sure that you reach out to us um, if you have questions about fundraising. And it looks like I have a question in the chat. It, what if a district government employee sends you a personal email, personal email to personal email to discuss a matter of district business off the record? Um, this seems to be a little bit separate from our Hatch Act question. Um, so this question seems to be a bit open-ended. Um, district government business should be conducted through district government email. Um, and so just generally, I would just advise that if you're going to be um, doing district government work duties, that that should be done through district government email. Yeah, maybe the maybe the person asking the question is just talking about district um, just district public information or something that's going on within the district. Mm -hmm. Um, if that is the case, if you're a resident and you're talking about a, maybe an issue with another resident, then that is okay. But as Asia has stated, if it's a district government matter that's specific to the government, and maybe if it's even if, especially if it's confidential, then you should conduct that business using your official email. Correct. All right. And let's move on to our next question. Okay, I'll take this one. So, can I fundraise for my boss's campaign? So, another fundraising question, another hatch act question. All right, as Asia has stated, um, the general rule within the hatch act is that district government employees are prohibited from fundraising for those district campaigns that are regulated by the DC Board of Elections. So, that prohibits a district employee from fundraising for someone who's running for partisan office within the district government. So that um, that includes persons who are running for mayor, um, attorney general, or as a council member. So employees are prohibited from fundraising for any one of those particular campaigns. However, if your boss is running, um, there is an exception. We're assuming that your boss is a district government public official. Your boss is a council member or the mayor or even the attorney general. There is one exception within the Hatch Act that allows those folks, mayor, attorney general, council members, to designate one employee to fundraise while on leave as well as outside a government building on their behalf. That is called the designation exception. So generally, no, you cannot fundraise. No, if your boss has not designated you as their designated employee, their designee, then you cannot fundraise for a district partisan um, campaign. However, if you are the designee, you have been uh, designated in writing. That actual designation has been filed with the Office of the Secretary and with Vega, and we post those on our website. Then you are allowed to fundraise while on leave, and as long as you are not in a district government building. Anything else to add to that? I'm not seeing any questions in the chat about that one. Thanks, Ashley. All right, let's go on to our next question. Rashi, did you want to chime in on this one? Yeah, so um, the question is, is the relevant agency always notified if an ethics complaint is substantiated against an agency employee? And if so, how? Um, no, we don't um, necessarily reach out 
If we substantiate a violation against an employee, those are generally public and they'll be posted on our website. And you'll find a lot of different things on our website from advisory opinions, negotiated dispositions, minutes from the board, um, all sorts of different stuff. Um, now, if we refer a matter back to an agency, um, something that's not necessarily for Vega to investigate, then the general counsel or the director may find out at that time. Um, we we ask uh, encourage our ethics counselors to um, take a look at our website and um, see what's new. Um, our director gave a great overview this morning of what is new on our website that you might have missed in the last year or so. Um, not always the case. All right. Thanks so much, Rushi. I'm not seeing any questions about that in the chat. So we can go ahead and move on to the next question. One thing, I'm sorry, Asia. Can I just go? Can I say a little bit more about the previous question? So um I do see a question. Oh, okay. May have been directed um, to you. Go ahead. If that's what you're gonna speak on. No, it's not. Um, I, I just wanted to um, inform employees. Maybe the person who asked this question feels as though they um, may face some type of disciplinary action from their agency um, based on a disposition from our office. Um, and I just want to um, clarify that Vega does not take any part in any type of personnel action that is um, conducted by the agency. Um, we are totally we're we're not involved in that process at all. Um, once the disposition is made public, or if the agency is the complainant, um, and they're notified because they are the complainant, then um, we don't take any action, any type of personnel action as far as terminating employees or putting them on annual leave or any type of personnel action, demotion or anything of that nature. And I don't see the question in the chat, so. I see it now. It was in the Q&A first and now um, it got moved to the chat. The question is, as an ethics counselor for an agency, can we request that Vega provide notice of a substantiated complaint? Um, I will say that, you know, we've had internal discussion about whether to notify the agency. Um, so far, we have not um, added that to our policies and procedures to notify the agency of a, of a disposition. Um, and so currently there's no mechanism to, for an agency to request that we notify them. Um, I, I can say that our, our minds and ears are always open about, um, the, the wants and needs of, of the agencies. Um, but currently there's no process for that. Um, and, you know, again, I will say that, um, you know, if we substantiate, um, some sort of code of conduct violation and say, yes, this did happen. We've gathered the evidence. We can prove it. Um, most likely you know, we will, um, our most common disposition is going to be a negotiated disposition. And again, those are made public on the website. So we kind of just for right now, um, we haven't, we don't have any plans to change our policy, but we would do encourage ethics counselors or general counsels or um, agency leadership to just go on our website and, and make it a regular thing, maybe weekly or monthly um, to see um, the newest negotiated dispositions that are added. We also have sometimes issue, um, we have show cause hearings and we'll sometimes issue orders and those are also published on our website. The only time where we would enter into um, a disposition in a case and we'll say we'll substantiate that a code of conduct um, violation did occur um, is if we enter into what is called an informal admonition and that's simply a letter to um, the respondent saying hey you violated this code of conduct rule please don't do that again um, and please get ethics training within the next however many months of the day of this letter um, and we issue informal admonitions um, for uh, minor or one-time violations of the code of conduct and those letters are confidential they're not made public on our website it's just between us and the respondent um we you know the rationale being that if something was a minor de minimis or one-time violation of the code of conduct there are some sort of extenuating circumstances or mitigating factors um we think it's just a benefit to keep it confidential and let the person know where they erred um, and ask them to get some refresher training 
Um, and so those um, informal admonitions are not made public, but other than that, if we come to some sort of disposition, that'll be made public on our website. If we um, do not make a finding, we will issue a dismissal. Um, if the agency is the complainant, meaning the agency reported the ethics violation, and we substantiate that the code of conduct was violated, then that went, at that time, the agency will be notified. We do have a policy to notify the complainant. Um, and usually whoever at the agency reported to us will receive a letter regarding what we did in the matter. That's correct. Um, but if you contact us and you want to find out about a disposition, then we're fine too. We're, we're, we're okay with providing you with that um, information as a matter of transparency. Absolutely. We're, we don't necessarily preemptively contact you, but if you contact us, we will um, discuss the dis disposition. All right. I'm not seeing anything more in the chat regarding that. Let's move on to our next question. So, next question is, may I run for office within my ward's democratic organization? Um, we talked earlier about the uh, local Hatch Act prohibitions, and the local Hatch Act prohibits employees from running for election to a partisan political office that's regulated by the district. And the term partisan political office means any office for which a candidate is nominated or elected as representing a political party, for example, um, mayor, council, attorney general. The definition of partisan political office does not include a position within a political party or an affiliated organization of that party. So that means you could run for your awards democratic organization. You could serve in that position as a district employee, but you have to be mindful of all the other rules that govern your activity. So everything has to be done on your own time. It's not done being done in, in government space. It's not using any government resources, not using your, your title or your position in, in any way. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. We have any questions about that? Check the chat. All right, we have a follow up question. Does that include A and C? That does include A and C. Um, A and C is not considered a partisan political position. Same with a member of the State Board of Education. Yep. And also, just to add to that, just to point out, um, many of you may know this already, ANC is the only, um, I guess you would call it political office, but not necessarily partisan political office um, that a district government employee um, can hold and also still maintain their district um, government employment. All right, um, not saying anything else about that. So let's roll right along to our next question. Maurice, right, I'll this one. Yep. So can I post political content on my social media platform? Uh, the short answer is yes, but with caution. Uh, posting political content will fall under political activity. So for this purpose, political activity has a broad definition and it includes any activity that is regulated by the district directed toward the success or failure of a political party. A uh, candidate for a partisan political office, partisan political group, ballot initiative, or referendum, and includes soliciting, accepting, receiving, or making political contributions on or other political activity. So now DC Code 1-1171.03 states that an employee may not engage in political activity while on duty in any room or building occupied and discharge of official duty or while wearing government uniform or official insignia. You can carry out otherwise lawful activity, even political activity on your personal, and that's emphasis add on your personal social media platform. However, you should not post political content while on duty. It could be deemed to be engaging in political activity while on duty in the face of that rule. Now also your social media platform should not include your job title or any other affiliation with DC government. Your social media should only represent you or some other organization and never seem to be official statements from a government official. 
People often add disclaimers to their social media when it's widely known that they work for DC government. For example, statements expressed on this page represent my own and, and not my employer. And then also with the social media platforms, a, a lot of them allow you to fundraise or post, uh, you know, the transfer app uh, function. So fundraising restrictions for DC political candidates will still apply for your social media posts. All right, let me check the chat, see if we have any follow up questions. Does anybody have any follow up questions about political content on social media platforms? I see one other question in the Q and A. In the Q and A, let me see here. Um, about recordings of our presentations, will um, will they be made available later? Oh, okay, yeah. Somebody said they missed the introduction presentation. Um, so I do believe that session was recorded. I don't know if we're going to be making that available on the website or not. Um, but once we, we, will. we oh, will. we will. Okay, the recordings. Okay. All right, Director Cook said we'll be making those recordings available on the website. I do know we generally make all the materials, the, the PowerPoint presentations and everything available, but I wasn't sure about the videos. All righty. All right, let's move on to our next question. Um, I'll take this one. Uh, is it ethical for a DC council member to create laws that directly benefit alliances? Hmm. All right. So, um, this sounds like a, um. Conflict of interest question as well as, um, preferential treatment. Um, so. Alliances, I'm, I'm assuming that you're talking about persons who the council member are affiliated with in some type of, um. Way outside of their council member status. So, um, the conflict of interest statute, it prohibits employees and public officials from using their official title and position, um, and pr are participating in a manner that would have a direct and predictable effect on their financial interests, as well as the financial interests of a person closely affiliated with them. Um, persons closely affiliated with, um, employees and public officials include members who. Persons of their persons who live in their household, um, business associates, business partners, outside employers, uh, persons who they may be um, negotiating, seeking, or have some type of arrangement for employment with. So the answer is no. Uh, council members or any any um, employee should not um, do things or or or. Um, engage in conduct or, uh, or exercise their official duties in a manner that directly benefits an alliance or, or someone that they're affiliated with um, as a matter of business or in their personal capacity. All right, thanks, Ashley. Um, does anybody have any follow-up questions for Director Cooks with regards to Council members or even DC employees generally. And also, I would add that um, employees and public officials should not um, engage in conduct that creates the appearance that they are giving some type of preferential treatment or engaging in some type of conflict of interest. So, if you have witnessed any activity of that nature, you can always file an ethics complaint and just include as much information as you can in your complaint. Absolutely. All right. Um, not seeing any follow up chatter in the chat. So let's move on to our next question. All right. Does uh, Russia, you want to take this one? Sure. Um, does Vega have a set of policies for contracting officers? Um, short answer no. Um, not anything separate than our code of conduct, but as director mentioned, this question, I mean, it kind of gets into conflicts of interest, financial conflicts of interest and possible preferential treatment. So 
if you are a contracting officer or a contract administrator or administrative officer, any of these things, you probably know. Um, and you probably know because you had to go through extensive training at OCP um, and the Office of Contracting and Procurement does have policies for contracting officers and they're quite stringent. So um, you can check out their website. It's ocp.bc.gov um, and they have uh, quite a bit for transparency's sake on the website, um, awarded contracts, that sort of thing. Thanks, Rashi. Um, yeah, and just to piggyback and, and be mindful that um, a contracting officer is going to have to follow all the policies, procedures, rules, and laws, um, you know, that OCP um, would, you know, monitor and keep track of. Um, and they also have to follow all of the ethics rules. Um, and so contracting officers definitely be holding yourselves to a uh, um, high standard of ethical conduct um, and make sure that you are on top of all of your um, trainings, OCP trainings, ethics trainings. Get your ethics training as often as you like. We have a monthly training um, just so that you're aware of the rules. Also be aware of, you know, different changes in the law um, with, regard, with regard to contracting. And let's see. I would just add that the um, the the ethics counselor, I believe there are two ethics counselors over at OCP. Um, it's the general counselor, counselor uh, Keisha Taylor and um, attorney William Bonilla. And those folks are very, very familiar with the ethics rules. Um, and they also have different internal policies and, and rules for their contracting and procure, procurement professionals, as Rashi has stated. So. Um, you may want to check with them to find out what additional rules outside of the ethics rules that are in the code of conduct that may apply to you if you're a contracting officer. Yep. Thanks, Ashley. Um, we have a, a follow up question in the chat. Can employees solicit donations from stakeholders slash contractors for the DC 1 fund? I would think not. Um, so. The DC1 fund actually has um, a unique set of fundraising rules. Um, we advise on DC1 fund every year and those involved with the DC1 fund um, contact us and we do ethics training for them. Um, we also you know, have our DC1 fund um, do's and don'ts posted on our website. Um, so you can definitely take a look at those. Um, they do they do do fundraising and they are allowed to contact district government employees via email. Um, and so, again, different uh, a particular set of rules and restrictions with regard to DC 1 fund. All right, next question in the chat. Will these training sessions count toward our mandatory training? Um, yes, um, each tra each training session will count as. Um, uh, training for purposes of the, the annual training requirement for financial disclosure statement filers. All right. Make sure, let me check the Q and A in case somebody put a question in there. All right, I'm not saying anything. Let's move on to our next question. What is the obligation of DC employees to report ethics violations? Um, so I'll take this one. Uh, district government employees have an affirmative obligation to report ethics violations. Um, this means that you're required to report um, potential ethics violations. Um, the specific rule is codified in the district personnel manual, section 1801.1. It says employees shall immediately and directly report credible violations of the district code of conduct and violations of this chapter to the District of Columbia Office of Government Ethics, the District of Columbia Office of the Inspector General, or both. So <clears throat> if we're conducting an investigation, um, and in the course of the investigation, your name you know, comes across our desk as a potential witness, we start to dig a little more, we come to um, understand that you know, you you already had the whole enchilada. You had all the information that we needed. You were aware of what was going on. Um, you know, if you had come and reported it to us directly, immediately, as the rule states, um, it could have saved us 
uh, X, amount, uh, X amount of man hours or resources or dollars, um, you have violated the code of conduct by not reporting that violation. Um, and so you could potentially be facing the code of co conduct violation yourself if you do not report. And so that is absolutely an affirmative obligation to report ethics violations to um, our office, to OIG, or to both. If you're confused, go ahead and report it to both. Um, we're going to handle the stuff that's squarely within Chapter 18 of the District Personnel Manual. Also, um, conflicts of interest. OIG is going to be um, fraud, waste, and abuse. If you think it has elements of both of those things, you can do two separate um, complaints to each of us. Oftentimes we refer things to OIG and they refer things to us. They may say, hey, that has more of an ethics flavor. Let's refer it to them. Or we may say, hey, this is more fraud, waste, and abuse. So let's go ahead and refer it to the OIG. Um, but either way, you want to make sure that you are um, definitely complying with your um, requirement to report. And also, I'll add to that, that there is also a duty to cooperate. So, um, just like there's a duty to report, there's a duty to cooperate with the functions of our office, which means that um, if we contact you for um, information, maybe you're a witness, we believe you have information that can assist us in one of our investigations, you have to um, cooperate with our interview request. Um, you have to respond and you have to show up for the interview. Most of our interviews now are conducted virtually. Um, so you have to um, respond to the WebEx, show up for the interview and provide truthful answers and truthful statements. So that in itself is an ethics violation if you fail to cooperate with our, with our, with the, excuse me, with an ethics investigation um, once we contact you. Absolutely. All right, let me see if I have any follow up questions about that. Okay, let me see. I got a question here. Is there is there not a duty for all DC employees to cooperate with all other agency investigations, OAG, child support, et cetera? Um, so the rule in chapter 18 of the district personnel manual speaks specifically to um OGE, which is also the Office of Government Ethics um investigations. So there may be an affirmative obligation, but the the rule that if violated would violate the ethics rule, the code of conduct speaks specifically to our office. So, um, a, a, an obligation to comply with other agency investigations might be codified elsewhere, and it might actually be some sort of personnel rule outside of the chapter 18 of the code of conduct. So it's quite possible that they, um, that rule exists somewhere. Um, it's just that the wording in our rule speaks specifically to our office. Any more follow up on that question? All right, not saying anything else. Let's move on to our next question. So, uh, next is the, what is considered political activity for purposes of the local hatch act? And I think Maurice went through, um, a lot of this earlier, but the local hatch act defines political activity as any activity that is regulated by the district directed towards the success or failure of a political party candidate for partisan political office, partisan political group, ballot initiative, or refer referendum. And regulated by the district means any election ballot initiative or referendum that is regulated by the uh, DC Board of Elections. So just as a reminder, when engaging in political activities regulated by the district, um, DC government employees cannot use their official authority or influence for the purpose of interfering with the result of an election. Um, they can't knowingly solicit, accept, receive a contribution from any person, except under the very limited circumstances um, that uh, I think Ashley was talking about earlier, um, if, uh, if you're the designee for a candidate um, or actually no, if you're a candidate or you can't knowingly direct or authorize anyone else to direct um, contribution unless you are that um, designee for, for one of the candidates. Um, and just keeping in mind again, 
anything that you can do um, is done on, on your own time, not on duty, not in any um, district buildings, not wearing any district uniforms, using any district vehicles, everything that is permissible is only permissible kind of in your personal capacity. Yes, thanks, Lynn. Anybody have any follow-up questions about political activity? Any points you feel need to be clarified? We have a question in the chat that just popped up. Yes, it says, if you have a LinkedIn or other social media account and like activity of district officials outside of government duty hours, such as announcing running for office, would that be a violation of the local Hatch Act? Lynn, I'll let you answer that one. You want me to read it again? Yeah, if you could, I was just trying to find it. Sure. Um, if you have a LinkedIn or other social media account and like an activity of district government officials outside of government duty hours, such as announcing a run for office, would that be a violation of local Hatch Act? So if you're on your, your personal account and what you're doing is you're you know, expressing interest in something, even if it's a declaration of candidacy, um, that's not going to present the same concerns as if you were, say, soliciting. So um, say liking somebody, saying that they're, they're announcing, again, you're, you're down, you're on your personal account, um, you're not using um, your, um, your government account, you're, you're not doing it kind of on duty, duty hours. I would say you would want to be careful, though, of mixing professional accounts with um, but like personal expression of your political interests. So I, I, I would I would advise that to, to be careful about what accounts you are using for what purpose. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Lynn. You know, the way the, the question is worded, it says LinkedIn or other social media accounts. And I actually a good question. Especially based on LinkedIn, because that yeah, looks like right. it's in your yep. Yeah, because it has your position you LinkedIn, there, right? Yeah. So it has your title for the exactly. most part on your on your LinkedIn, which yep. is very different than your personal Facebook, which you know I would suggest not having your 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 position on your first personal Facebook, so you're not you know, restricting what you're doing on on kind of the personal side of things. Yep. So. Absolutely. Yeah. By by na by the very nature of what LinkedIn is. It's most likely going to have your position and title on it. Um, so it, it to me, it's a completely, you know, separate thing from other social media platforms, which you can you can easily keep completely personal and not list your position and title at all. All right, we have another one. Is a general statement like it's election day, make sure you vote without partisan or candidate specific content considered political activity. Lynn, I'll let you chime in first. Yeah, I mean, if it's just a general, like, get out the vote, that's very different than advocating kind of on behalf of a, a partisan political candidate. So everybody should vote is very different than I encourage you to support this candidate. Right, yeah. Yep, I agree. Um, the key to the political activity is going to be partisan political candidate, ballot initiative, referendum, those kinds of things. Um, and so general um, uh, speech that has um, words about voting or politics in it is not necessarily going to fall into the definition of political activity. Exactly. And that definition, remember, it starts off by saying for the success or failure of a political candidate mm -hmm. partisan or, you know, so if you're just saying, just go out and vote, that's not for the success or failure of a particular candidate. Let's see if we have more questions. All right, we have another one. Can a director of an agency solicit donations from non DC employees for the DC one fund? The non employees are individuals who do business with the agency. If this is on your website, I apologize. <laughs> so, can a director of an agency solicit donations from non DC employees for the DC one fund? Um, and so these non employees are individuals who do business with the agency. So, maybe um, seems like prohibited sources, vendors, or contractors, and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. So, I think the first part is they 
yes, they can solicit it, solicit from um, non um, employee individuals. But the second part seems troubling to me. Um, prohibited sources, vendors, contractors, right? Because absolutely they will donate a bunch of money to the DC one fund to curry favor with that director or, you know, that agency so that they can get another big, you know, contract with the district government again. Um, and so that second part is, is a little bit troubling to me. And we actually do have guidance on DC one fund um, restrictions on our website. So, if you go on our website and go under um, advisory opinions, you'll see we have about 3 or 4. Um, 1 sheets about DC one fund do's and don'ts. And as Asia has stated, uh, soliciting from prohibited sources is definitely a prohibited activity when it comes to the DC one fund. Right. Um, not seeing anything else. Let me check the Q and A. And also, I would encourage um, you to contact your one fund coordinator, or the chair of the DC one fund to make sure that um, solicit soliciting outside sources is acceptable. Because that may just even if the person is not a prohibited source, that still may be an issue. Uh, we got another question. Can I share that information with my agency? I'm the ethics officer for my office. Absolutely. Um, we encourage you to do so. If you can, you can go right to our website and pull up our um, do's and don'ts one pager. It's very plain language and very easy to, you know, read and understand one column. This is what you can't do with regard to DC one fund. The other column, this is what you can do with regard to DC one fund. And so you can use that, you know, annually, you can use that. And as the ethics officer, you can distribute that um, throughout the agency, starting at the top with the leadership um, and make sure that everybody is kind of aware of the ethics piece of the DC one fund. And Rashi just posted the link in the chat. So, if you want to copy that link, feel free to do so. The, the do's and don'ts document, it talks about all of the, the prohibitions as well as permitted activities when it comes to DC one fund. Um, it talks about no, you know, pro, 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 prohibiting coercive practices, um, setting 100% um, participation goals and things of that nature. As well as gambling. So, let's check that out. <laughs> Thanks, Rashi. All right. Uh, any more questions about um, DC one fund or political activity? All right. Let's move on to our next question. And I think this may be our final question. Then we can open it up for general Q and A. Maurice. Want to take this one? Yes, I'll take this one again. Uh, it's a juicy question, so I hit a juicy answer for it. Uh, can I work a part-time job with a vendor for my agency? And so the short answer for this was maybe, but with an abundance of caution. So here's my abundance of caution. So DPM section 1807.1 DNE state that an employee shall not engage in outside activity, such as a part-time job or secondary employment that we that will be deemed improper, such as maintaining a financial or economic interest in an outside entity, if there is a likelihood that such entity might be involved in official government action or decision taken or recommended by the employee or would permit the employee to capitalize on his or her official title or position. So, Bega advises employees against working with a company that does business with their own agency, since doing so drastically increases the likelihood of a conflict of interest or the appearance of a conflict of interest. Now, to avoid a conflict of interest issue, like presented in dual employment, uh, a DC government employee can file a written recusal or must file a written recusal to their supervisor to not be a part of any decision-making procedures involving the company. Uh, please note that an employee must recuse to avoid a conflict of interest, but an employee cannot recuse themselves to the extent that recusal 
would cause them to become infect, ineffective in their district government work duties. So if the part-time employment is so involved in your official duty, you and you recuse yourself from that, then it inhibits you too greatly from doing your job, then you wouldn't be able to carry that that part-time employment with that that outside employee. Now the DC government employee also may never negotiate or be a signatory on a contract or application for the outside company to DC government. And the employee may not be compensated for any outside duty that is substantially related to their official government duty. Employees are generally advised to not do work for companies that do business with their own agency. All right, further, an employee may never be on the clock for DC government and the outside employer simultaneously. The outside activity must be conducted outside of your official tour to duty and the employee must use appropriate leave for the matters of the outside employer that occurred during official time. Uh, this situation is also contingent on the DC employee's role within its government agency. Uh, some employees due to their leadership positions must also submit a written recusal to Vega to receive a waiver. And if the factors of the employment or affiliation presented are deemed improper, the waiver will not be granted. All right, thank you, Maurice. Very thorough answer. And um, to piggyback on that and make sure that I highlight um, something that Maurice says, um, that Maurice said, we advise against this. Um, almost just generally asking the question about a part time job with a vendor for your agency, it is almost certainly going to be a conflict of interest. Um, there's also the most important outside employment rule with regard to working for a vendor that does the business with your agency is going to be maintaining a financial or economic interest in or serving with or without compensation as an officer or director of an outside entity. If there's any likelihood that such entity might be involved in an official government action or decision taken or recommended by the employer, right? And so um, the agency signing a contract is most likely going to be an official government action then making some sort of decision or issuing an order or something like that that would be official government action so that element is almost always going to be there so i venture to say that 99 percent of the time even if you're not violating any of the other outside employment rules you'd be violating that maintaining financial economic interest rule um, by taking a part-time job with a vendor for your agency um, if you if you contact us and ask us if you can do this, we are going to say, no, you can't do this. You should not do this. Um, and so there's also a difference between um, part time job with a vendor that works for your agency or, or and a part time job with some sort of company that generally does business with the district, some other agency. Um, if, if they if they do business with a different district government agency. Um, you may be able to engage in that conduct as long as you would be able to follow all the other outside employment rules and it's not otherwise a conflict of interest, but you definitely want to 100% avoid working a part time job if the um, company does business with your agency. Anybody have any questions about that? Part time job with the vendor. Let me check the Q and A. All right, I'm not seeing any questions um, specific, specifically regarding our last question. All right, so I'll take this time to open it up for general Q and A. If you guys have more questions that you want to ask us, if you have burning questions that you've always wanted to ask Bega, you just hadn't got around to calling us or emailing us or something like that, please feel free to ask. We have about 10 minutes left in the session and we welcome your questions. And I'll just wait and make an awkward silence now in case you guys are writing questions. <laughs>
All right, I'll give you guys a minute or so more to ask us any questions. And I'll take the time to say we appreciate your questions. Um, you know, a big part of what we do at Vega is advice and education. So we want to answer your questions. We will much rather answer your questions and do trainings for you guys rather than investigate, you know, potential um, code of conduct violations. So um, ask Vega is something that we always like to do um, because we want to get those questions. I think maybe some people like the anonymity of ask Vega. Um, you don't necessarily have to be identified um, when you submit your question, but you know whether you want to remain anonymous or not, please stay in contact with us. Uh, we love advising and giving you advice. Advising and giving you advice. All right, let's see. I have something in the chat here. With the COVID vaccination status, would Bega be the one to contact if an HR personnel um, I'm assuming employee, HR personnel employee, shared your status with your manager or director? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, this seems like this could potentially be violation of some sort of personnel rule or possibly HIPAA. I don't want to go too far outside of my jurisdiction because I don't think disclosing the vaccination status is even a violation of HIPAA, but I could be wrong. Um, there may be a DCHR issuance on the matter. It, okay, yeah, there could be. Um, yeah, DCHR has issued a lot of memos um, and materials with regards to COVID. So you can um, contact them or check out their website. Um, I think they do have a tab about COVID on their website. Um, and so that might be the place where anything, any guidance they've issued, um, you can locate or you can always reach out to um, an attorney there. Uh, and ask them this question, but no, we would not be the place for that. Um, the great thing about Vega is that our world is very finite and we have our jurisdiction and we know it. And um, no, unfortunately, this is not, this is not one that we would handle. Any other questions? Oh, and uh, one other thing, if you submitted a question to us and you didn't see your question here, um, and there might be a couple of reasons why your question wasn't here. We liked the nice round number of 10. I thought that 10 would 10 questions would fill up the. The session time. Well, also, we got some questions that were either too broad or too specific. Um, and so I didn't think that I, we would be able to answer them properly in this um, forum. However, if you did not get an answer to your question, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, you can email Vega at DC.gov or you can contact one of us directly. Um, most of us, I think, are just first name, last name at dc.gov, um, and we will try to get that answer for you um, directly. Asia, can you give some information about the sessions for tomorrow? Sure. So tomorrow, let's see, I have my handy dandy schedule right here. Um, tomorrow will start at 12 p.m. Um, and we're going to start out with ethics and yoga, um, and that is going to be presented by our lovely general counsel, Rashi Raj. Um, and she told me today that she actually has experience and she has given yoga classes before. So um, it seems like it's going to be wonderful. I'm going to be on there um, probably doing yoga very badly. Um, and so she's going to be discussing some um, ethics concepts with you. In a, in a lovely uh, meditative voice and giving you some, giving you a yoga class. Um, so that'll be great. And then uh, the next session will be at 1 p.m. It's called Unlocking the Positive Values of Ethics. Um, and if you attended Ethics Week last year, you may be familiar with this. Um, it's going to be given by Marcy Maslow. She's a Chief Integrity Builder from um, eFactor. That's her company. She is a great ethics professional that we came across some years ago in one of the trainings that we actually attended. Um, so we've been, you know, um, inviting her to come back and she seems to be well received by you guys. Um, and so those are the two courses that we're going to be offering tomorrow. Um, so we can't wait to see you back tomorrow. And I'm not seeing any questions. And since we are almost up on our. One hour session, I'm going to go ahead and say thank you to you guys. Let me show you really quickly again our names, the folks that were answering your questions today.
and wrap up. We appreciate your attendance. We appreciate you pre-submitting your questions. All right, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and end the session. Thank you all. Thank you to the panelists for helping me answer these questions. Thanks guys. Bye.